On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Peter Teitelbaum. He is the Director of Site Reliability Engineering at Peacock. We're going to be talking about the SRE, the SRE function, building it out, you know, the business impact, uh, a couple of different angles, see how much we can fit in with Peter. I'm excited to have him on. Peter, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's start off uh, with two things. Um, let's find out what Peacock does. I'm sure a lot of people know, but let's find to make sure everyone is aware of what the company does. And also, as the director of SRE, what are some of the responsibilities that fall in your lap? Sure. So Peacock is a TV streaming service. Uh, we used to call it uh, OTT or over the top, but uh, streaming seems to be the term that's that's taking hold now. Peacock has been live for, um, actually, it's almost th- just over three years to the day that we're recording this. We launched on April 15th of 2020. <clears throat> Obviously, a very crazy time to, uh, uh, to launch anything at the height of the pandemic. Um, but Peacock is a streaming service that um, has a um, uh, both a VOD, a video on demand, as well as uh, live offerings. And uh, my role um, as director of site reliability engineering, um, really my, my first role when I joined the company was to actually build out an SRE team um, and help to define what SRE would mean at Peacock. Um, today, as a little over three years um, into it, the way I like to define it, what we're doing in terms of SRE, um, resiliency is a huge piece, right? We need to make sure the platform is resilient um, and stable. Um, there's a lot of automation that goes into place, um, as well as infrastructure management. Um, and observability is a huge piece of that as well. Awesome. I, I, I'm excited. And, and actually, let's let's start there because... You know, SRE could mean different things, different places, um, as you as you referred. What what does it mean exactly at Peacock? The way I like to describe this, and I'll I'll dive into um, the way I like to put it very often is as a spectrum, right? And I say that on one end of the spectrum, you might have organizations that have a traditional um, system administration or operations practice. They've been doing this for quite some time and they've effectively rebranded themselves as SRE because it's a a little bit trendy these days. Um, But on the other end of the spectrum, you have Google and literally they wrote the books on it. Um, Several books, in fact. So I think most organizations fall somewhere in the middle. At Peacock, I think uh, we fall much closer to the Google side and, and really um, there's a few reasons for that. I, I like to say that we've tried to build our SRE practice on, on four pillars, and those are software engineering, uh, resiliency, automation, and observability. So those four pillars really come into everything that we do. And what I mean by that is I, I touched on resiliency a little bit before. Um, we need to make sure that everything is automated. And that software engineering piece is possibly one of the most important ones because really, uh, and I'll certainly give Google the credit for this because it was in one of the SRE books, uh, taking a software engineer's approach to solving operations problems. So that means everything from monitoring to managing infrastructure, it's all done as code. Thanks for that. I think that's a great overview. Um, I was going to actually ask you, because you mentioned the four pillars and observability is one of them. And I I guess there's you know, before you can look at, at what point do you kind of look at those four pillars and, and do you pull them apart and kind of ha- have their own teams? I don't know if currently they're their own teams under you or they're all in one team, but how does that, I guess, make up work for you right now? Sure. I, I think it's actually really tough for them to be separate teams. And the reason for it is every single one of them touches on the other three. And, and what I mean by that is, even if you think of something like observability, we'll take it in its most simple, um, uh, broken down sense, say a dashboard or an alert. Well, how do we manage something like that? We want to manage it as software. Same thing with, with resiliency, right? We want to make sure that our code, our infrastructure is resilient. We want to make sure um, any um, chaos engineering or any testing, whatever we're building, it's all managed as code. So I, I think in that regard, it's really difficult to break them down as far as separate teams, but I think it works better as when you have different teams that are focused on different areas, they can use these four pillars sort of as their uh, their North Star, if, if you will, right? It's, it helps to guide some of the decision-making and how we solve problems. And I guess as I mean, it makes complete sense. And, and And when you kind of look at the SRE function, 
and the interactions with other teams, right? Obviously, there might be some you know collaboration impact. How does the SRE team fit within the other teams and and kind of that working relationship? There's no great answer for that. It really depends, and I say it depends because it depends on teams that you you work with as an SRE. There are some teams that. Um, and I hate to use the term maturity level because that suggests that other teams have a, have a path and they might, some teams might not be mature, but, um, really what I'm getting at is when it comes to something like we were talking about observability and dashboards and alerts, you may have some teams that, um, uh, need a little bit more handholding than others, or I shouldn't even say need, they may want it, right. They may want to say, Hey, I've got this great idea. Can you help me to build this? Um, where you may have other teams that are very uh, self-service, and not only will they run with their own dashboards, alerts, uh, they will also um, uh, instrument their own custom metrics um, in their source code. They will submit pull requests for infrastructure. Like they're a little bit more more tight in. So I think what that level of engagement uh, looks like really just depends on on the type of a team that that an SRE group will partner with. What about the relationship to security? Because obviously some of the pieces you talk about are not security, but some of the pieces start interacting with some of those, those, those at least thoughts. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. That is definitely something that's going to vary a lot from organization to organization. Uh, in some orgs, you'll have a uh, security become a practice of SRE and in others, there's a completely independent security team. Regardless of whether there's a separate security team or you're managing security within SRE, we all have to be security focused, right? We all have to think about things like, in the most simplest form, um, where are we getting packages from? What do we have uh, plugged in for base images on containers? And then we want to take things like that and figure out, okay, how can we build tests against it? How can we make sure we stay a step ahead um, uh, of these types of things before we have a problem. Obviously, security is a, a very deep, deep, uh, complex topic, and there's so many different places to go with that, from from networking to software and, and whatnot. You know, the, I, I guess I've talked to a few SRE leaders, and you know, the growing importance and impact on the business is kind of something that's come up a few times, and you know, becoming a more of a a business enabler, um, not just a, hey, you guys need to. You know, manage the four pillars, but actually being brought into the conversation earlier in, in the process. Is, is that what you're seeing or are you seeing something differently? Yeah. In fact, there was a great, um, I believe there was a great graphic on this in one of the Google books, if I recall right, that really helps to show getting plugged in early. And I, I think that's really important because where SREs can really help out is some of the resiliency. When you when you think about it from a from business perspective, if you you build something um, and ultimately overlook or, you know, we deprioritize dealing with resiliency up front and we find out we've got a problem. Uh, you've got some impact in production. Um, I think it was maybe 10 years or so ago. I think many folks remember the big healthcare issue where uh, there was some massive resiliency and performance problems. Um, obviously, that's an extreme example, but those are the kinds of things that we want to avoid. So if we can get SREs plugged in early, start looking at these types of things, um, as well as focus a little bit on automation. And, and one of the big things to help businesses that, in my opinion, um, is a little bit around, I guess, DevOps principles, and especially CICD, right? The faster we can get things out the door, the better. Um, now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't deliver in an unsafe way, but the faster we can get features out to market, the better the business is, is off. So really where I'm going with this is what tests can we write as SREs? What can we bake in at the simplest form? It might be thinking about things like linting and unit tests. What can we build for integration tests, even performance te performance testing and chaos testing, bake these types of things into, pi into pipelines to really enable those, those dev teams to just get their features out the door fast. I guess, yeah, you said you, Built and I guess part of you know this question will piggyback off of what you just mentioned regarding you know, business enablement and also just you know building out the SRE function uh, at Peacock. But what about you know the, the overall company culture? Like the you know it, it, if you're introducing something new, 
you mentioned obviously some companies have different views of SRE. You got to have everybody buy into what it's going to mean at one org and then kind of build out what that will be culturally. Kind of walk us through that and and and, and what that process looked like for you. Sure. I, I think I'll start by saying this is certainly a tough field because everything is constantly changing, right? So it's really tough to stay. And this goes beyond just SRE, just in this in this cloud and tech space. Uh, it feels like the industry is reinventing itself just every few years. So we're all trying to keep up. And I think I'm mentioning that because that's really important to culture. It's impossible for any one person to stay on top of everything. And I, I think a really valuable engineering culture certainly something that I've tried to, to build and maintain is one where we're always able to look at new ideas, new ways of doing things and have a very collaborative culture within a team where engineers can pick up on different things, have different ideas and, and essentially bring them back to the greater team, uh, whether it's a whiteboarding session, a demo or, or whatever the case might be to share ideas and allow everybody to learn, uh, learn from it um, as well as them to learn from everybody else. You know, I guess as you're looking through, you know, at the time and you're, you know, deciding, hey, we're going to build out this function, you have to start looking at different models, how you're going to support the company, you know, are you going to leverage offshore, follow the sun model, is that, is that you know, kind of how you're going to deploy the SRE function throughout the company? What were you looking at? What were some of your thoughts in terms of how you'd want to see that implemented? Sure. Well, I think even before any before looking at offshore the first thing to start thinking about is um are you looking at remote versus on site and that is something that's obviously a very hot topic these days and um you know there's pros and cons to each right if you have everybody in one location in the office there is a sense of camaraderie that is hard to get when you're when you're remote and in my opinion one of the worst scenarios is when you're half and half if you've got half the team um, that's on site in an office and you've got everybody else remote that creates a, a situation that I think is often um, not so great because you could have um, half the team huddling up and solutioning things. And unfortunately you've got a lot of other folks that are just miss out um, on, on that. And, and everybody uh, hurts um, from that. Um, what I try to do is actually go fully remote. And that one of the great advantages of going full remote is you know, it doesn't really matter where anybody is, right? You can be anywhere in the country. And in fact, we have people everywhere from uh, LA and Texas and and um, and Pennsylvania and, and several folks in the New York area as well. So there's also a, ironically, we're talking SRE, there is some value in terms of resiliency uh, by having everybody spread out as well, because, uh, you know, you have a major storm system that moves through a certain area. Well, uh, you have people that uh, can support the platform in other locations as well. So um, moving to your, your comment about um, offshore and, and follow the sun, that's actually something that I'm working on um, very heavily right now. And um, really, I'm looking at it from two perspectives. I mean, number one, the follow the sun is great because deliverables just keep happening all the time, right? You basically have have uh, one engineer that just hands it off to an offshore engineer and they they pick it up and they're running with it. They're handing it off again and again. But another way that, that I'm looking at it as well is to leverage offshore for on-call support. And this is something, unfortunately, that in this industry gets a really bad rap. And there's a lot of people who, um, rightly so, have been burned um, by really bad experiences uh, with on-call, getting paged, you know, perhaps five times a night, you know, every time they're on call and, and, and you know, makes them really nervous. So I think offshore is a great way to help with that because you can leverage offshore as your tier one support, right? Where they get, get, they get the page first. Technically, it's not a page because it'll be during their business hours. And if your offshore team can't resolve whatever the issue is, then they're going to turn around and they'll, they'll escalate it to your on-call engineer, uh, who's really your, your second tier of defense. I guess have have you seen success with that? I, I know you're still working through it, but I guess previously, or do you you know have you do you have experience with with implementing that and some successes around it? Um, I, I, not not yet. Currently, I'm still very much in process of of getting this implemented. I've definitely worked with offshore models um, previously in in my career. I have definitely had success, but I think I will say what I'm trying to do now is actually far more ambitious than what I've done in the past. So I'm I'm very optimistic, and it looks like everything is going in the right direction. So um, if we 
chat in uh, you know a, a year or so, I'll be able to give you a better update. There you go. Might might, might have a a whole episode with you in here just to talk about uh, how the implementation went. Do you? I, I actually think most SREs or people in, in this the DevOps people always have some, you know, harrowing stories of having to put out a fire, you know, late at night, wrong time. It seems like it's like a, a ER doctor on call in the middle of the dinner thing. Any anything interesting happened to you uh, on call wise? Oh, there's there's so many. Um, fortunately, these days it's relatively quiet. But looking back earlier in in my career, um, I'm trying to pick up a, a, a good example of just one in particular. Um, I've definitely had them in the past uh, as far as database issues, some really bizarre database issues. I would say the worst type of on call experience, quite frankly, is something like a disk filling up on a on a um, on a server somewhere. And getting paged out multiple times for the exact same thing. That's really a place where I think teams need to look at their on-call situation and, and really do um, an on-call handoff and review it um, week over week, month over month, whatever your on-call shift is for the organization. And really look at what's what's making the noise and how do we make this go away? Because that's one of those things that creates a terrible experience for engineers. Uh, it does not help with the culture of the company. And ultimately, it, it hurts the business too, because we're taking time away from from other feature work or whatever it is we need to uh, do to, to deal with these incidents. Um, so that's a place, um, and, and this obviously segues into an observability topic, but um, since I mentioned disk space alerts, I'm not a fan of things like that at all, right? If the service is operational, it's functioning, who, who cares what the disk space is on the machine? It's It really is trivial. You know, and, and you've gone through this journey, obviously, of and you're still building out, you know, various various parts of um, the SRE function. Now you're looking at a follow the sun model. When you look at where people fall along, you know, in SRE spectrum and, and the maturity, you know, I guess is the work. Can the work ever be done? Is 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 it? Can there be a point in which you go? You know what? We're, we're as mature as can be, or is it constantly there's there's something on the horizon that's going to push out where that spectrum could possibly end? It, it never, ends. never uh, ends. I really don't think it ever ends. I mean, I, I can say earlier in my career, um, even without being focused on SRE, there'd be things that come up and I would wonder, what are we going to do in a year from now and two years from now once we've got all these problems solved? They never end. There's always new problems to, to solve. Um, I think one of the ways that SRE helps is we we are able to focus on solving a lot of these problems and moving on rather than band-aiding some of them. Um, and I think that kind of ties in with the maturity model. Managing everything as code. Every time there's an issue, I keep coming back to managing as code because it really is so important. But every time there's an issue, how do we solve this? How do we make this type of a thing go away forever? Um, is this something that we can leverage automation for? Um, it, it, anytime there's a bug that gets its way out into production, we want to take a look at it and break that down. Is there a type of a test that we could have written or that we could have created to to catch this in the future? And look, if we're managing this code, maybe we could catch that. Maybe a performance test is needed, whatever the case might be, some, some sort of a custom test. Um, I think all of that ties in with the maturity model. Um, one of the things that I'm I'll go back to observability because one of the ways that we operate is dashboards, alerts, manage, all manages code deployed by CICD pipeline, um, even have unit tests baked in to validate all the alerts. I think that's something that's really important. You definitely don't want to get caught in a situation where you've got something that fails and ultimately nobody found out about it because uh, an alert got, got tweaked and, and ultimately there was a something simple like maybe a syntax error and whatnot. Automation, I think, is a really big, big piece of that, right? Especially as an organization scales, you can't just scale by adding more and more people. It starts to break down. It doesn't always work really well, um, especially if by adding more people, you're just having them do the same task repetitively over and over again. Um, auto scaling is a great place uh, to look at automation, um, marrying, sort of marrying with some of the other pillars of SRE that we talked about, like marrying automation and observability together. Um, there's so really there's there's a lot of different tenets, I would say, in, in terms of maturity. And and it's and it's obviously a, a role that typically requires some 
decent broad experience exposure, right? You, 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 Cause a lot of people do want to move into the space, right? They, they hear about it. It sounds interesting. You know, there's a lot of complexity about it. If somebody wants to move into SRE, is it, is it a role that you can move into really early stage? Do you need to go do other work functions and then move into SRE kind of what's the path for someone to actually land into an SRE role? So experience definitely helps and it really goes a long way. But here's the thing that's really interesting about the technologies that we're working with. Most of the folks I would say in the SRE space today have probably just learned about a lot of these technologies. And when I say just, I mean, maybe within the last five years or so, because so many of them are so new. Um, obviously, Kubernetes has been around for a little while, containerization for around for a little while, but I'm not sure if either of them have been around for longer than 10 years. The great thing about this space is you can sit in a Starbucks or your favorite coffee shop or by the beach if there's Wi-Fi or cell service, and you have access to all of the same technologies that most organizations are using out there, whether it's Terraform or whatever programming language, all the clouds, AWS and, and Google you can build infrastructure on your own. You can learn how to use these things on your own. Um, and if somebody really wanted to, to break into this space, I, I think what I would probably recommend to them is, I mean, number one is learn a software programming language, uh, whether it's Python or Go or probably the two most popular languages in the SRE space. But it might also be valuable for them to take a look at some job descriptions for SREs and look at what technologies seem to be really popular out there um, that many organizations are, are looking for. And like I said, you can sit down on your laptop um, and spin these things up and, and just get a feel for it. It's not like the industry was uh, perhaps 10 or, or 20 years ago, where if you wanted experience uh, working in um, in this industry, you had to be part of the industry to have access to data centers and networking and all of these types of things. It's just that that barrier to uh, to entry has has really dissolved the way. I, I think that's it's actually amazing advice. And and when I'm sitting here listening to it, I'm like, you're right. Like, yeah, the opportunities are endless. I mean, you, you just need uh, some time and some desire. And it sounds like, you know, you, you can uh, catch up really quick uh, with, with some baseline. You can you can find your way in, which is pretty remarkable. I was going to ask you a question I've been asking a lot of leaders and um, it's, it's not because uh, you might have it or, or, or it's, it's the way it's phrased, but I've, I've been calling it tech FOMO. Um, and I'm alluding to the fact that there's always evolving technology right now obviously ai is being discussed in every you know every thread everywhere something about ai and you know you start hearing people start drum about things and you start getting curious and you know i'm sure other technologies are being thrown your way vendors this will solve all your problems and it, it probably takes time and effort and, and trying to resist it sometimes or embrace it. it's all different you know uh, aspects of the job um how, how do you deal with that tech fobo how do you how do you sort through it? How do you determine what's right, what's not right, timing, all that kind of stuff? You know, in, in my opinion, there's no there's no uh, um, magic bullet or, or silver bullet, whatever it is. There's, there's always other things. Many things are going to pop up in products and, as you put it, can solve all your problems. Um, I don't think that's entirely true uh, for what it's worth. I mean, they might be able to solve some problems and they might introduce some others. I think it's worth taking a look at some of these these products and, and, and technologies, I think in general, throughout my career, I've liked to stay just a little bit behind of cutting edge. Let everybody else be the alpha and beta testers and, and let's get the product honed. Um, and then we'll bring it in. I mean, I, I'm weary of, of using something that's so early in beta, for example, that you have problems in production that can't be solved at that point. What do you, what do you do? So I think it's good to always be learning about some of these new technologies and perhaps run POCs from time to time and explore them. But um, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of new technologies, and I don't think that will ever stop. If anything, I imagine it will just speed up. Absolutely. That's a, that's a fair point. Peter, uh, I was going to say, it's been a great discussion. I appreciate your time. Uh, if somebody does want to reach out to you and, and pick your brain on anything you mentioned on the podcast, what what's a good way of getting a hold of you? Sure. LinkedIn works. LinkedIn. Okay. Yep. We'll make sure to include that um, on the show notes, uh, but I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. 
But that's it for this episode. We'll be back again, different guests, different topic. Until then, please share the episode with somebody else that might find it interesting. That's how the podcast grows. Like, like, subscribe, leave a review wherever you do listen to it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Until next time. Bye-bye.